Hey friends, it's Michelle Lamoureux, and today I've got a really interesting show lined up for you. We're going to be learning about personality type from a leading expert, and we're going to be talking about it as it relates to both your romantic relationships and teams within companies. And that may seem like a stretch, but stay with us and you'll you'll understand how it's connected. Joining us is Rob Toomey, who's the co-founder of Type Coach. He and his team at Type Coach work with people in the world's leading organizations to improve team performance, deepen leadership capabilities, and help salespeople close more deals. However, among the most powerful outcomes from their work is the impact on personal relationships outside of work. Today, Rob and I will get into the applications of personality type differences in the context of the romantic relationships and understanding where you and your romantic partner are similar and different on just a key few key elements of personality that can make a huge impact on the quality and ease of your most important relationship. Welcome back, Rob. Michelle, it's great to be here. So I have to just tell the story. So Rob and I worked together in a different life when I was head of marketing and he was an attorney at a law firm. And I didn't really know you, Rob, there. And one of the other attorneys, this woman, Kristen, was like, oh, Michelle, you know, you're getting trained in, you know, personality type and you're so into this stuff. Do you know Rob? And the next thing I know, you and I met for coffee. And I think in a blink of an eye, two hours went by and we were just so engaged in all of this. And I was like, oh yeah, Rob's like my favorite person now. Um, he's so interesting because I love talking about this stuff. And then I did get trained in it. Um, but when I went to launch the show, I reached out to Rob and he was my very first interview. He's not the first interview I aired, but he was actually my first interview. And what's so funny, Rob, is even though you and I know each other and are friends, I was so nervous. The second I hit record, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. Like, I don't know if anyone could hear it in my voice, but I was, it was funny. And here we are now, five years later. Five years flew by in a, a heartbeat. Well, you're natural at it, Michelle. And it's been great to see your whole uh, universe expand as you've done this. Oh, thanks, Rob. I mean, yes, and I do love it. And it is fun. And I think it's fun for people to know that context of how we know each other and um, and the really great work you're doing. I mean, in the last decade plus, I mean, you, you're you literally in like every major company and doing all this great work and around the world. And I remember you telling me what your vision was over 10 years ago. And I mean, it's just congrats to you too. Well, thank you. It's been a sort of a pinch me moment along the way. You know, we didn't anticipate when uh, my wife and I started the business that it would take us into now we're in seven languages, we're around the world. Uh, but there's a universal element to this whole personality business. And we really were kind of the first ones to put it into the context of improving interpersonal communication versus, you know, helping me understand more about myself. And that that seems to have hit a nerve. Totally. I mean, I think based on what I know of your work. And then also you sent me a video to watch before, you know, so I could prep for this. I was just like so many like aha moments. I was like, oh gosh, this makes so much sense. I can't wait to introduce this to my audience. So I think this is going to be really fun. So tell us a little bit more about what type is and the impact it can have on people and companies. Sure. Well, and I'm also just really excited because I get to sort of flex different muscles here today. So while we talk about the corporate context all the time, it's very common for us to hear from our participants, you know, this has changed my marriage or I'm going to uh, handle my kids differently from here on out. Uh, so I'm excited to expand the dialogue a little bit uh, here and talk about some of the things that we know are really important, but we don't get to often sort of cover uh, with our corporate clients. So yes, yeah, so we use two different models of personality in our work. Uh, one's very familiar to most people, which is the, the same model that underlies the Myers-Briggs. So it's Carl Jung's model of personality type. So extroversion, introversion, and so on. Uh, we, th we think of these are the sort of building blocks of personality but it drives a lot when it comes to communication. So if you're aware of the personality of the person across from you, and again, it could be your romantic partner, could be your boss, could be your kids, uh, you can make some certain adaptations that really make things go a lot more smoothly. And that's really what we've been focused on teaching for the last now 19 years. Gosh, it's 20. And actually when I said 10 years, it probably was like longer than that when we were sitting <laughs> and talking about it. And then it was probably five years later by the time I launched the show. And here we are another five years later. So I'm just realizing it was probably a lot longer um, when you were telling me about the idea you had. Um, walk us through the four type categories so people have the context for the conversation we're about to have today. 
Sure. Super high level. And, you know, a lot of people are somewhat familiar with this, but there's a lot of programs out there that are very superficial in nature. So uh, extrovert, introvert, for example, which is the first category, it's not about social skills and social graces. It's about where you drive your energy from and how much stimulation you uh, prefer to handle. Uh, extroverts are stimulated by getting out and dealing with other people. Uh, it's sort of a fun hot take, like, you know, looking at the world of Zoom and Teams where people are interacting you'd think that extroverts would be just as satisfied with the sort of you know back and forth banter you can have in the, in the virtual medium, but it's not the same. Uh, they really need the physical presence of other people to recharge their batteries. Uh, introverts on the other hand is about 50-50 in the population, recharge their batteries when they have some time alone, uh, just away from the stimulation, some time to reflect and process. Uh, and that's, that alone time is sacred. Uh, so for them, if they don't have it, they really start to wear down pretty quickly uh, and head for the exit. That's so important. Okay. That's the extroversion, introversion. Want to take us through the next three categories? Sure. Okay. So the next one, we use the term sensing and intuition. Sense tend to be more grounded, practical, and realistic, focused on the here and now. So they're looking at the world around them for the details, the sensorial elements, uh, and they tend to have a pretty good memory for those. It's about two thirds of the population on that side. The other third are what we call intuitives. Their brain tends to focus more on future possibilities and imagining what might be. Uh, they have a lot of energy for uh, considering what the future might look like. Yes. Okay. And then the third category? Thinking and feeling is our decision-making preference. So thinkers tend to default to the pros and cons, objective, objective analysis. What would anyone in this situation do? Whereas feelers tend to lean into, uh, how do I feel about this? Is this consistent with my values? And they also have an easier time seeing the impact the decision is going to have on the people involved. Yes. And even as you're saying this, if you're, if you're a manager, leader in the team, you could see how there's so many implications to how people, what their personality tendencies are, right? It's Indeed, really a tendency. Yes. Okay. And we, then the we fourth... like to think of them as an impulse, right? So my impulse might be to look at things from a pros and cons perspective. That's not the only thing I'm going to do. And in fact, as people mature, they're like, oh, well, I can't just do that. I need to do the other side. Uh, but notably, when we get stressed out, both at work or at home, we tend to go back to our home base, to our preferred yes. version. Yes, where it's comfortable or just rea like, yeah, reactive, like you said. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. And then the fourth category? This is, yeah, this is how we approach the world in terms of structure. So uh, judgers, which doesn't mean judgmental, just means they have a preference for reaching closure and making decisions about things, tend to be more planful, organized, and structured. Whereas the perceiver side, which is you and I, have more playful, relaxed, spontaneous, and open approach to their schedules uh, and sort of how they live their lives. And that's that's about 60% on the judging side and 40% on the perceiving side. Yeah. And do you, is there any data on couples? I don't know if anyone's ever studied this in terms of how many overlap or how important it is to have that. I mean, they say opposites attract. And I know like just from having done my own type and I've never had my husband take it but I could pretty much figure out what, where he is. And I'd say we probably share two mm -hmm. of the four letters actually, maybe. Yeah. Two. No. Yeah. So I, yeah. Two, not, two. Yeah. We've not seen like any real good research done on this. Um, and to the extent that there's been research done, it hasn't been done the way that I would really like to see it done. Yeah. Uh, but anecdotally I can share out of, you know, the tens of thousands of people who've been through our workshops um, it's quite common and more than statistically likely that people end up with people who are very different from them from a personality perspective totally. and the romantic couplings. Uh, and it's interesting because we don't know why that is, but we can sort of uh, suggest that it's because we're drawn to certain aspects of difference in that person that we hope will become more of our style over time. Right. So the super extroverted person who looks at this other introvert and they're like, wow, they're so calm. Right. And so how can I draw myself towards that kind of style and energy? Maybe part of the initial sort of attraction. Totally. Or the introvert might see somebody who is easily connecting or just getting their energy from being around others. And they admire that and want a little bit more of that themselves. Yep. Right. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So often in relationships, there's a disconnect in communication because someone isn't feeling heard or given time to process. So what's the biggest thing to keep in mind when living or working with an introvert or right, so, extrovert? So yeah, let's, let's, we can break that dimension apart, right? So yes. a, a lot of times, and you're going to see some universality here. So regardless of the context that we're in, you're going to see some elements emerge. So we think the most important part of the introvert extrovert dynamic is what we call the two to 48 hour rule. 
So introverts do their best thinking when they have time to reflect. Mm. Uh, so if the extrovert comes in all sorts of excited about a new idea, <laughs> right? The introverts usually somewhere between two and 48 hours away from their best thinking about this. Yes. Uh, and so often there's a disconnect because of the time uh, sort of distance. The extrovert's you know, really thinking about this and wants to talk it through and the introvert wants to reflect and then come back later and have the conversation once they've had that preferred moment of reflection. So it really comes down to how do we honor that natural preference, that natural wiring on the introvert side. Okay. So I think I'm pretty certain my daughter's an introvert. I pick her up from school. I don't know if this is also because she's a teen, but I'm like, how was your day? Let's, you know, I miss her. I want to engage. And she's like, I just want to sit here for like, I, she needs, she's, she'll use a word that my husband is used. She's like, I need time to decompress. Yes. And I was like, okay. And so I've learned to like, it's not personal. She just, she literally needs that little bit of quiet because she's just been engaged for seven hours at school. And she need, or, you know, when my husband would come in and same kind of thing, be like, Hey, what's going on? Or I got to talk to you about this problem and all this stuff. And he's also an introvert and he just needs that moment to at least ground himself within the, the, the house. Right. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I always like to point out that everyone has their limit on how much stimulation they can handle. So like even you and I as extroverts and probably higher end extroverts, we'll reach a point where like, you know what, I need that decompression too. Totally. Introverts hit it faster. Uh, and so a full day of stimulation out in the world, their first move when they get away from that environment is yes, calm so I can reflect. And so the pro move for the parents of introverts is give them that quiet time to reflect, leave them alone, let them sort of do their processing, and then they're going to come down and they're going to like more likely initiate. Uh, and it's in that initiation that you can start to probe your question. But if you go in too early, right, and it's funny because it even shows up earlier in uh, in our lives. So uh, parents of introverted kids, often two extroverted parents, are doing a lot of stimulation for that introverted kid. But there's some magic in showing up to a birthday party early before everyone else has. So your introverted kid can get some one-on-one -on -one time with the the birthday boy or girl. And then as the room starts to fill around them, they don't actually notice it. And there's not as much sort of um, stimulation or, or sort of uh, intimidation factor. If they just walk into a room full of 50 people, they're like, wow, that's a lot. So there's lots of little ways that this shows up. Okay. And give us an example in a work context. Well, what happens a lot, and we get this feedback from our clients all the time, an extrovert manager looks out at a team primarily of introverts and misreads their lower level of obvious energy as a lack of engagement. Uh, and then often like they'll introduce a topic and expect an immediate response to that topic, but they're actually two to 48 hours away from the engagement that they're gonna see later on. And so it's really just managing that expectation that it's not a lack of engagement, it's not a lack of sort of curiosity or you know they plan to uh, get jump, jump into it. It's just, you have to time it so that they come to the meeting prepared to participate. I love it. And I do want to go back to what you said about as an extrovert, I need that time too, for sure. And I've, as I've gotten older, I need more of it. I don't know why I just, I do. Um, and so, yes, it does not that I think there's an, you see a lot of posts where it's like, I'm an introvert and it's all about how, you know, it's kind of comparing themselves to an extrovert and they make these assumptions about extroverts, like being able to just go all night and not need <laughs> yeah. any, right. We're not and energizer like, bunnies. Yeah, right. we're not right. We need, we have our boundaries too and need that, that recharge. Okay. So let's talk about friction in a relationship based on someone's need for more in-person social engagement. What tips can you give for an, an introvert married to an extrovert who may like somebody's always making these social plans and the other partner's like, oh gosh, like, didn't we just see somebody yesterday? Like, why are we, why do you have more plans on the calendar? How do they sure. navigate that? Cause I, this, I've seen this with friends. Yeah. Well, what reminds me of one of my favorite comics, which is a husband and wife standing on the doorway to a friend's place. And it's clearly they're going into a party. They're holding a bottle of wine. And one of them turns to the other and says, I'm ready to leave whenever you are. <laughs> okay. um, so <laughs> So, I mean, I, I think it's it's navigatable uh, when you are able to put the language of personality in there and you understand that this is just a difference. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a difference. So some of my favorite examples are uh, friends who are turbo extroverts and they need to go out all the time paired with an introvert who's like, go. 
I will be here. I'll be here when you get back. And I'm going to pick and choose which of the events or social outings that I really want to participate in. Uh, but I'm not expected in this relationship to go to all of them. And so just being explicit about that expectation is important. I'd also give a tip to the introverts that if you're heading into a sort of dynamic or uh, intense social environment, pick some people who you know are going to be there and think up some topics that you'd like to discuss with them one to one. And the conversation becomes much richer for the introverts when they're the ones in charge of the topic mm. and steering it towards something that they already have interest in. I love that. That's great advice. That's great advice. So then they feel more relaxed walking into it. Exactly. And they're also not at the mercy of the biggest extrovert who, you know, puts them in a corner and says, here's, here's what I want to talk about. You know, right. they, they, you know, they've already primed the pump for that two to 48 hour thing. They've come in with a topic that they've got some real interest and curiosity around and they can more, more easily participate with that. Totally. And I was thinking about working in the law firm and going to a lot of these networking events with the attorneys and seeing the so much discomfort and just reminding them, like, be yourself, just ask some open-ended questions, you know, don't feel like you're there to just pitch yourself because you're not, you're there to be a human being that people find relatable, right? So what advice would you give in that context of, because, you know, there's a lot of networking events going on again, thankfully. Yeah. It's actually, it's one of those places where there's a lot of similarity to a social event. Look at the guest list, the attendee list in advance, pick out the three or four people who you think are most high targets and then go after them for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, I have also found that introverts tend to do better one-on-one -on -one networking, right? So mm -hmm. maybe that's not even the best forum for you. If you're really feeling more on the edge of that introvert side on the extreme, you know, don't put yourself in that spot where it's going to feel uh, awkward. Reach out to the people that you have in mind for that conversation and, and you know, try to connect with them one-on-one. -on -one. Totally. Or maybe just head to the bar or the food station where maybe the other <laughs> introverts have gone to just to like ease themselves in. No, everybody heads to the bar, I think. So that's probably not the best example. Um, okay. Translating a vague future vision into reality and understanding the practical, tactical questions. Okay. So you had said to me, um, okay, so some people are high level future focused and others are practical and focused on the here and now. What are some of the challenges this can pose in relationships at or at work and tips for navigating this one. For sure. And this is the sensing and intuition difference for those of you tracking. So right. this one shows up all the time. So as an intuitive, I often have a bunch of ideas that relate to some point three to five years out in the future. And I get excited about that because that's part of who I am. That's part of uh, what I'm looking for. And when I share that with a colleague or a romantic partner who's on the sensing side, they often introduce a number of very fair questions about the feasibility and practicality of said vision. And I can often misinterpret that as shooting down the idea or wait a second, why are we talking about how we're going to make it happen? Let's talk about how great it is. And so the realization is that for the sensing types, their ability to evaluate whether this is a good or bad idea actually hinges upon the analysis of the practicalities. So asking them to just give you blanket feedback, good, bad, or ugly on an idea without allowing them to do that review is unrealistic. Okay. Uh, so we've, we've learned this in my, my romantic partnership, which is also uh, my, my work partner. Yes. I've got a great idea for my personality type business. And my wife says, well, how are we going to make that happen? Yes. And what's really happening is she's trying to understand whether this is feasible and if it is feasible, by the way, she's going to get excited about it because now not only does it have some bright possibilities in the future, but we can see a path to getting there. Okay. So talk to us in the context of, let's say, a CEO and their team, because oftentimes it, a CEO is that visionary, not always, but oftentimes. And you know they may have people who are very task-oriented and like you said, thinking about, well, wait, how does this translate? How much more work is this for me? What, what does this mean for what I'm going to be doing? And what if it doesn't work and all th that yeah. side of it? So. so I'm going to preach patience, right? So the key thing when you introduce a new idea is to budget time for those logistical practicalities uh, and recognize that there's real value in going through that process. Because what ends up happening is your idea will become clarified and it actually will modify as you look at it through the lens of how do we make it happen? Okay. But a lot of intuitives don't value that process sufficiently, in my opinion, and just want to sort of get a blanket thumbs up or thumbs down and move forward. When in reality, the time spent on the clarification is essential. It's essential to you know making sure we're heading in the correct direction and determining how we're going to get there. Okay. So we talked about how the intuitor can talk to or approach the sensor. Let's flip it. 
Uh So how do we flip that? So what does the sensor need to be? How, how would a sensor or should they maybe consider responding when the intuitor has this grand idea? So we need to connect what we're suggesting to that longer term piece. That's where the excitement is. So intuitives basically buy and support things that they feel as though it's connected to where they're heading. Yeah. And so if you show them, you look in three years time, if we do this, this is what's going to happen. They're like, wow, that's really great. What sensing types tend to do is explain how it would work. And that's not the selling point. That's not the sort of uh, moment of truth for the intuitive. The moment of truth, truth of them is, is this heading where we want to head? Is this consistent with our long-term, you know, personal financial picture or where we're going to live when we retire or at work? It's like, is this consistent with our long-term strategic plan? And if the answer is yes, then the intuitives, generally speaking, have a pretty low appetite for the how. (laughs) That's not going to be really a key part of it. They're sold based on whether or not this is consistent with that longer-term piece. Mm -hmm. And how much of a conflict is this in relationships? I was just thinking about what you just said and where are we going to retire? Like, or, you know, somebody's visioning for the future and somebody's very much in the now, like give us an example of how that might play out. Yeah. So it's budgeting time for both. That's the key. Uh, What you can't do is try to do both at the same time. I can't have a conversation about the future while my partner's having a conversation about here and now, because those two conversations are ships passing in the night. So you say, let's start the conversation with a little bit of refresh on where we're going and then spend time specifically on the practicalities. Uh, And that's, that's when both parties feel that their perspective has been incorporated and honored as opposed to they're not listening to me. And that, that frustration that emerges when you're, you're talking about two different points in time. Okay. And this is good. All right. So let's get into the thinker feeler. What tips do you have for people who are highly relationship oriented, dealing with people who are more logical, transactional, and give us some specific language each side could use to be heard and received. I am- (laughs) <laughs> a feeler here and my husband's a thinker. I know that that's, that's clear. I'll jump out with a really simple one. So yeah. uh, asking a thinker how they feel is a complicated question, Yeah, right? They can do it, right? But it's going against the grain. Mm-hmm. If you're asking a thinker what they think about something, it's very easy for them to sort of articulate okay. and vice versa for feelers. They can access their feelings and they can articulate it pretty easily. But the objective piece, how, what do you think about it? How can you articulate the pros and cons here? While they can do it, it's not really where their starting point is. Yeah. So just using feel versus think language is, is really uh, a very easy thing to do. Now, more substantively, what we notice is that feelers are looking for that personal connection, right? They really want to have that sort of um, we're, we're back together, reconnecting moment before we get into anything transactional, right? So. Yeah. Um, if I'm a thinker and I'm coming into whatever the context, again, romantically or at work, I really want to spend time on, hey, how are you doing? Where are we at? You know, that that time spent without a transactional component to it, as opposed to, hey, did you, did you mail that thing or did you do that thing? Getting into a transactional question too early is the temptation to avoid. Okay. What if you have partners who, and by the way, I have shifted, like people I know that are more thinkers. I never ask them how they feel anymore. I'm always like, what do you think about this? Because I learned over time there was a bit of a disconnect there and I want to speak more of their language or what makes sense to them. What if you've got partners who actually are both thinkers or both feelers? Because sometimes you need a little of the other side, right? You do, you do. And so you need to watch out for leaning too heavily on the same preference, right? So if you have two thinkers, well, who's paying attention to the romantic connection? Uh, If it's a romantic element and if it's at work, it's, hey, are we doing enough for morale? Are we doing enough to sort of not just get stuff done, but really feel like we've built trust, that we have that sense of connection, that I would go the extra mile for uh, my colleagues when I know that I have that special connection. This isn't just a colleague, this is a teammate. Uh, And so, you know, making sure that if you've got multiple thinkers in that relationship context, that they're paying attention to those human needs. Uh, And so for feelers, if you have two feelers together, it's making sure that we're not just going with our gut We're not just going with how we feel about it. We're saying, all right, let's step back for a second. What would anyone do in this situation? And it allows you to ask the question in such a way that you can see, well, maybe my heart is pulling me this way, but actually there's probably some balancing to that to to find either a moderate version of my outcome or potentially even go a different direction. Yeah, this is really important. Um, And I'm thinking of like many examples from my own (laughs) life on all that, Um, especially when you say go with your gut. It's like you can have that knee jerk reaction, like, 
no, you can't go to that thing because, you know, my gut's telling me, and then it's like, wait a sec, this could work. We could actually make this happen. And so we, if we go back to that word impulse, right? Impulse is just a very natural way of describing it, which is not a good thing or a bad thing. My impulse is to do this. And then we catch ourselves as a mature adult and say, is my impulse the correct thing for me to do here? Or is there something else that I want to consider? There was, there's one more piece on the thinker feeler I wanted to introduce because it's really, really important. Okay. So uh, feelers are looking for empathy before a solution is provided. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when they're feeling down or when they feel like they're in a a challenging spot, um, the temptation for a lot of thinkers is to step in and try to solve. Um, And in fact, if you, if you unearth what the impulse there for the thinkers is, it's trying to be helpful, Mm -hmm. but it's often misplaced because what the feeler is really looking for is knowing this, this person's there to support me. Um, There's also an element here, which again, works both in the work and uh, home space where if I just step in and I have the arrogance to solve the problem, I'm suggesting that person didn't have the capability on his or her own. Mm. And so I have to be careful about triggering this sort of um, sort of uh, patronizing element where like, oh, here, step aside, I'll help you, I'll, I'll help you know, take care of this for you. Right. You had within the video, you sent me another video where there's a guy and a woman and you can't see her face initially. And the guy's like, well, I think you should just take it out. And she's like, you're not understanding me. And then you see her face and she's literally got a nail in her forehead. I mean, obviously it's for the video, Mm -hmm. Um, but she was looking for that empathy. And until he can give her that, she's just arguing with him. It's really funny, actually. I might have to link that. You'll have to send me that to link that. You should put that in. It's a fun fun example. And by the way, there is no gender element that sort of covers this. There's a slight gender difference. Yeah. But you know, you can have men who are feelers or women who are thinkers. So I want to clarify that the video yes. is obviously an exaggeration, but it really does go to the <laughs> point of I'm looking for support, not for the solution. So I encourage people right. to check that out. Right. Cause she's like, my head hurts. He's like, um, just because you the got nail a nail out. right there. Right. Yeah. He's <laughs> like, you've got a nail in your head. And she's like, you don't understand me. And finally he's like, oh, that must really hurt. And she's like, oh. That's right. I'm yeah, so sorry it. that you're going through that right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. she softens and feels seen. And then he still wants to get the nail out of her head. Really <laughs> <right>. <laughs> okay, so let's talk um, perceivers and judgers. And again, does not mean you're judgmental. I always like to clarify that you already said it once, but um, okay, so perceivers need a deadline. Uh do better with deadline. And I'm a perceiver. So I know this firsthand. So if it's open-ended and there's no sense of urgency versus the judges who like have their next two years planned out in their schedule, there's the structured versus the spontaneous. Give us an example of how this plays out and how to avoid this trap. Because this is a, this is a big one, I think. This is a big it, one. And I think maybe this is where people get attracted to their opposites a lot. Agreed. So it's both a, a really powerful place to enrich the relationship if you're able to uh, enjoy the benefits of both. Yes. Uh, but it's the one that chips away at the quality of the relationship little by little the most on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, so it's because a lot of little tiny frustrations, microaggressions or frustrations, right? It's not that I don't like this person, but I really wish that they would do stuff differently. Totally. So the main overarching message for this one is to watch out for the intent. Um, often we think the other person's behaviors are intentionally designed to frustrate or annoy us. Right. When in fact, it's really just the person's wired differently. Totally. Uh, so my wife and I experienced this when we were dating very early on uh, and she's on the planful structure judging side and I'm on the playful relaxed spot perceiver side. So she obviously had most of her weekends planned out well in advance. And there was, you know, three, three months into the process. I like, you know, I haven't seen some of my friends. Can we work that into your schedule? She's like, no problem. So she went into the day planner back in the day, right? And she circled Rob's weekend and so she left it alone. And then the Tuesday before that weekend, she said, what are we doing? I'm like, I don't know. Isn't that great? <laughs> Thinking that I was going to play to my strength, which is being spontaneous. And she's like, are you doing this to prove a point? I was like, no, not at all. And we realized that her desire to plan is not something she has to try to do is how she is. And my desire not to plan is the same. So really just moving the intentionality out of the equation is a huge piece of it. Um, I would also uh, like to introduce this notion that without a deadline, perceivers um, will go as long as they think they can. So a classic example is a judge or spouse turns to their romantic partner and says, hey, can you clean out the garage? And the person's like, sure, no problem. 
And if the person's a perceiver, they believe they have until the end of time yes. to do that assignment. Yeah. <laughs> so when they're 90, they'll do it. That's right. So two weeks later, the judger is upset that it hasn't been done and the perceiver hasn't even been uh, put on the clock yet. So as far as they're concerned, there's no issue, right? So yes. you can see the intentionality piece just you know creates lots of little issues. I love this one. And let's talk about it in the context of work. So everything I did had deadlines. And I would think probably people probably thought I was a judger. I mean, we would have multiple events happening, like 20 different balls up in there all the time yeah. with me and my team. And everything got done. And with the deadline, I was super focused, interestingly enough, on the details because I knew it meant the difference between a good event and a, an amazing event or things like that. So it's not that if you're a perceiver, you you can't access those parts and it's not that you don't get things done, but socially, like you said, for me, that's where I see it. You know, even my husband, I think he's probably a perceiver too. Um, but professionally, I mean, I I've never seen anyone be more focused on getting stuff done than him, but does, does it play out differently professionally than it does personally? Yeah. So, I mean, judges and perceivers at work may look fairly similar, but the yeah. energy that's being sort of brought to bear on certain activities is very different. Okay. So the, the challenge for judges at work is handling the unexpected and readjusting plans as they shift. And I actually have a lot of sympathy and empathy for judges right now because the world is so dynamic. Plans rarely stay on plan. Mm. Uh, and so they're constantly going through Gosh, this COVID. morning period, right? COVID yes. threw everyone off. It introduced, injected a ton of uncertainty, which really affects the judges mm. in a more substantial way. So their challenge is, okay, how do I make sure that I'm creating new plans when the current plan has been washed away? Perceivers like, well, there was a plan, I don't know, whatever. Um, so their effort <laughs> is going into staying organized and meeting those deadlines and expectations. And so okay. it's just, you, you, you have the work requires both. Um, but you know, the way that we get to a mature, competent performer in the office is through a very different process. And it's deadline oriented when it's a perceiver and it's yeah. letting a judger know things in advance to not stress them out, right? And don't throw things on them last minute yep. if you can help it. And then they also need to learn how to, that sometimes things just, they just come up. Can you give us another example um, personally though? Because I do think like I've seen this with friends where- just literally that that garage example is like a perfect one. Yeah. So you'll notice the tension exists in the family relationship when you have a judger who's pushing for closure about all sorts of things, vacation plans, flight travel plans, whatever it is, and the perceiver is not ready to pull the trigger on that. And so there's a tug of war. Are we making the decision today about our trip in March? And the judge is like, yes. And the perceiver like that feels like a February time frame for us to make that decision. So they're just operating on a very different notion um, little things show up too. So we we had this wonderful example. Uh, a woman stood up in front of like 150 people in our workshop, and she said, uh, "As a judger, I have my um, you know suitcase packed by the door two days before our our <laughs> flight and our trip, right?" And she's like, literally three hours before the flight, my husband's throwing a load of laundry in the wash, uh, and so she's like, "My relationship <laughs> has gotten way better now that we meet at the airport." Mm -hmm. um, and so like you have this, like, it's a good workaround because her desire to not have anything go wrong in security or at the gate or whatever is solved by getting there early. And he's just not interested in that at all. So rather than go through the mess of her standing there watching him fold his laundry 20 minutes before the taxi arrives, go about your separate. Okay. But even as a perceiver, that stresses me out thinking of him being at home and then she's there and about to board the flight and he's nowhere inside or just about running through the gate at the last minute because that seems uh -huh. like that could happen too. So mm -hmm. I give that person credit <laughs> for not <laughs> feeling the need to be there and just being like, you need to move faster. Yeah. Um, so again, if you have two perceivers or two judges, somebody's got to take on a little bit of the, like somebody's gotta, you got to yeah. flex. That's a good word. Yeah. So a couple things on this, because it's important uh, to sort of get out what we've shared uh, and seen over the years. So two judges have to be um, respectful of the other person's need to have control over the planning, right? So they, they're both trying to make reservations oh, wow. at restaurants. They're both trying to do all this stuff. So taking turns. And, and the good news is if you trust the person because they're planful, organized, and structured, you can trust them to, to manage this. Uh, but they're often jockeying for control. If that oh, makes interesting. Sense. Gosh, that's actually interesting. Yeah. Yep. And then you have two perceivers. Yeah, their plans are going to have to happen. So who's going to do them? Uh, my best suggestion is you divvy up. 
All right, so you are in charge of you know this with the kids, or you're in charge of the vacations, or this vacation, uh, because what ends up happening a lot of times is they don't reach clarity about who's doing what, and then there's a lot of disappointment that it didn't get handled. Yeah. Um, I will also put a little footnote on this, and I, I don't like this truth, but it does seem to be that a lot of women end up taking on the role of the judger in the romantic yeah. pairing with with two perceivers. Totally. And I was actually just going to say that. I was going to say the mom energy trumps all of that. And then the mom's just like, stuff's got to get done. And so if yeah. I don't do it, it's not going to happen. And then they just be, because that's me. Yes. <laughs> that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. There's all that great stuff on the default parent concept. If you've come across that, where no. one person just like, if, if both parents receive an email from the school, they already know which one's going to be responding. And that's the default parent. Yes, uh, I, I want to make sure that the balance is being uh, as equally distributed as possible. And the only way that we've seen that happen is by a um, almost like building a constitution or an agreement in, in place in advance. So like when this sort of thing comes in, you're responsible for it. When this sort of thing comes in, you're responsible for that. It's interesting. So in my romantic uh, pairing, because we work together, we have yes. no choice but to do that with the business. And so it spilled over a little bit into the the kid and the parenting and the romantic side, because we're good at doing that sort of separation of powers at work. Okay. Let me ask, do the, the J's, the genders, do they enjoy the planning? So like, do they ever want to break from that? Because I get envious of like, my friends who are like, oh yeah, my husband planned the whole trip and whatever. And I was like, oh, that sounds so nice. <laughs> You know, no offense. Yeah. I love my husband. Um, but you know, I, cause I'm usually the one who does it and it's not that he's not capable. Honestly, if he spent the time, he would probably make it the most creative fun trip that we've ever gone on. Um, it's just a matter of bandwidth. So uh, well, I'll be the first one to say, I think the next trip should be on his, uh, on his plate. I'm going to tell him. <laughs> yeah. but set some deadlines and expectations in advance. Right. So there's clarity around what the outcome, cause so like we, we joke, um, we do this exercise, uh, in our workshops, we say, all right. So um, if you tell someone you're going to get it, uh, the assignment done by Friday, right? We ask the judges in the room, when do you expect to receive it? And the answer is somewhere, you know, mid-morning on Friday, they expect to have the document or assignment completed in their hands. And then we ask the perceivers, when do you expect to provide it? And the answer is close of business Friday or as late as Monday morning, because <laughs> what were you going to do with it over the weekend? Totally. It's and so the reason we we emphasize being explicit and clear about what the deadline and expectation is, words like Friday mean different things to different personalities. And so if we're not clear about that, then people back into un, unintended but still disappointing consequences. Okay. Can you talk about how to help a teen who's a perceiver? So it sounds like the judges have everything in their calendar and maybe also how to help them because maybe they're more stressed out than they need to be because both, both will be, because if you're waiting to the last minute, I, that was me in college. Oh gosh. Yeah. I can just remember every paper, <laughs> you know, Mac lab yeah. three in the morning. There I was by, well, with the other perceivers. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Wondering why there's no uh, printer paper or whatever. Totally. So, yeah. Um, so for judges, the, the advice is twofold. So first of all, budget in mentally, that things are going to go wrong and build in a buffer for your planning. Uh, so if you think that this assignment for the team is going to take six weeks at work, it's not, it's going to take longer and just be realistic about the unexpected things that are likely to come up. Okay. Um, so that would be, that would be part of it. Um, and then also budget time to not do anything. It's funny, but like scheduling unstructured time allows the judger to just sort of unplug from being productive uh, and being productive is such a core part of who they are. They need breaks from that. Uh, and that's the downtime that they're looking for. So it, they'll often overfill their vacations where it's like running from one thing to another. Uh, so build in some breaks for yourself. Uh, that's the, the biggest self-care I can recommend for the judges. Perceivers, especially for talking teenagers, um, you know, this is a learning curve. Uh, so I think it's really important to understand that you can't do a three month long project in a week. Uh, so you have to learn how to back up from the deadline. Uh, and we've all learned that the hard way, Michelle, like we're, we're like, we're trying to do this huge thesis or whatever, and we just did not budget enough time, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that there's going to be a flurry of act activity before the deadline for the perceivers, but making sure they left enough room for that. That's the key. So open questions like, Hey, how long do you really think it's going to take? And what's the, what's the reasonable time for, for you to start to make sure that you have time to finish. Those are the kind of leading questions that might help. Yeah. And what if they're procrastinating starting? Well, they are right. Like and even so, day-to-day homework. Cause I have a friend who's just like, my kid's going to bed at one, two o'clock every day. Cause she just can't start. 
So the only advice I can give there is to actually back up to the last aspect of personality that we just covered. So you're going to make a logical argument or a relationship argument. So for the a thinker uh, who is staying up until one o'clock in the morning, point out the logical consequences of that continued behavior. Oh, interesting. Right. And for a feeler, it's like, hey, I need you to help me out because I and so it's a personal appeal that would fall on deaf ears for the thinker but wow. actually makes makes an important impact for the feeler as a listener. And that would work in, in a team as well as for teams, it sounds like, right? So knowing the thinker versus feeler, that's interesting. Yeah, so like, it's funny. So like we, we often will notice that executives have challenges delegating sometimes as they move into a point in their career, they've been accustomed to doing something so they have a reluctance to let it go. Yeah. And so for thinkers, we point out, well, you can't advance to the next stage unless you do that. So that's a, that's a consequence, logically speaking. For feelers, it's, hey, you're actually preventing the development of the people on your team who are coming up behind you. So if you're not giving them that assignment, they can't grow. And they're like, oh my gosh. And so it, it actually resonates more for them to help the other people on their team than the logical consequence of the behavior. Okay. Um, and I'll cut this part out. I'm just looking at the time. Do you think it makes sense to go into the temperaments or no, that's too involved? I was uh, thinking core yeah. values as it relates to temperaments. I can do it very quickly, just at okay. a high level. Yeah. Because I think this was good. Okay. Um, let's transition into the temperaments, Rob, because I did watch your presentation and I was like, oh my gosh, the temperaments as it relates to core values, like huge awareness from watching that and really feeling seen. So can you walk us through the temperaments and how those core values are um aligned with them? Sure. So this is the the second of the two models that we use in our framework, and it's getting at why. Why do people do the crazy and wonderful things that they do? Uh, and this is the place where we see the most sort of emotional intensity, because when you're touching on someone's core values the wrong way, you start to see fireworks emerge. Yeah. So there are four temperaments and that actually lines up with the first model we covered, but we don't need to get into that. But I'll describe that the first group is driven to be reliable and responsible. So you can most say those the SJs. The sensing and the judging combination, right? So yeah. Um, that's the combination. And so that means that they take most of their actions very seriously. They take their commitments as I've made a contract with this person to do what I said, and it's important that I'm going to follow through. Uh, when we insinuate that someone in this first group uh, is not reliable or responsible, we're going to start to see a really strong reaction because that's their whole identity. That's like wow. what they're trying to accomplish. And so if we trigger that, so one of the classic ways to do this is to give them a hard time when they drop a ball. Right. So, oh, I thought you were going to get back to so and so. And they just did one million things during the course of the day. And that's the one thing they didn't do. And you're mm -hmm. going to bring it up. Mm -hmm. It's going to create an inflammatory response. Okay. Uh, so be careful with that, regardless of the context being professional or personal. 100%. Yep. So the next group are the sensing and perceiving types in combination. Their core values are around taking action quickly and getting impressive results. Uh, like when I'm doing career coaching for them, I'm always saying you need to be where the action is. Mm. Um, and so insinuations that they don't have control or autonomy over their freedom, uh, that's when they start to really get into trouble. Or if you try to restrict them from doing things that they want to do, you're going to start to see them doing it anyways to prove that you're wrong. Uh, so <laughs> th there's a, a willfulness to them. Uh, and okay. you'll often see this, um, you know, in the more immature stage of life that they'll obviously uh, emerge more quickly and clearly. Okay. Yep. Next. Then the, the last two, uh, intuition and thinking, yes. uh, that combination uh, has a drive to make a lasting uh, innovation and improvement impact on the world around them. So some kind of legacy that before this person came in, it was here, and now it's in an improved place uh, thereafter. So they spend a lot of time uh, doing that. And if they feel thwarted towards uh, making an impact or having their ideas and suggestions for improvement and innovation fall on deaf ears, <clears throat> you start to see some real uh, emotional energy emerge. And that's often when people leave work. They're also driven to be competent at certain things. So not everything. Like, so if they've decided to be good at something, they're going to be really good at it. Yeah. And that's when you need to be careful uh, with the feedback, because if you've uh, tackled something that they view themselves to be really good at, uh, then they're going to have an emotional reaction to that that feedback. Okay, this is so good. Yeah. And people <laughs> are going to be thinking about people they know, even if they don't haven't typed them, I think they'll know. 
Yeah, it, it resonates. So we see this all the time. Uh, every human interaction has these elements baked into it uh, if you're paying attention to them. Totally. Uh, and then the final the final group is your group, the, the idealist group. So mm-hmm. intuition focused on future possibilities, but now combined with the feeling element. Uh, for them, it's all about helping others uh, achieve their fullest potential in life. <laughs> it's literally uh, what my show is. <laughs> it made me laugh. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh my God, you see me. Yeah. yeah. And so much energy comes from yes. working in alignment and uh, moving in the direction of our core values. So if you feel as though you're doing that kind of impact, then work doesn't feel like work. And it yeah. feels energizing and natural. And, and there's a ton of uh, energy pushing you in that direction. Uh, and so where where you have to watch out with the idealists is going against their core values or asking them to go against their core values. And, and I've stumbled into this because I like to do an intellectual debate on certain topics. And I didn't realize that my friend who's an idealist was emotionally invested in that topic. Mm. Uh, and so I, I stepped on a number of values that I thought were intellectual exercises. Mm. Uh, and that's something to be, uh, I think, careful with. Uh, certainly something I've learned the hard way. Totally. The authenticity too was a piece of that that totally resonated. Um, anything I didn't ask that you want to touch upon before we wrap up today, Rob? No, this is a great conversation, Michelle. And I, I wish that more people were aware of these elements. Um, one of the things, you know, we talk about, you know, what does it mean to live the good life? Uh, and for me, it's uh, letting go of the trappings of success that we've inherited from those around us, whether it's our parents, uh, our social structures, our educational experiences, most people spend the first 50 years of their lives heading towards a definition of success that someone else gave them. And understanding the personality type piece for me is allowing yourself, giving yourself permission to pursue the things that you find naturally energizing. So uh, if if I can encourage people to learn more about this stuff so that it allows them to do that, uh, yeah, we've done something good. Totally. And if you see yourself and you feel validated, like it makes you understand yourself better, which is all part of our journey anyway. Um, all right. Two fun rapid fire questions. Just whatever comes to mind as a type coach, when communicating with others, I would never. Ooh, um, I would never, uh, just assume that they're the same personality type as me and give them the information the way that I would like to receive it. Okay. And as a type coach, when communicating with others, I always. Well, I try to figure out what's going to work best for them to understand what I'm saying. Uh, So I'm trying to look for the little adaptations that I can make to make sure I'm getting my message across. Love it. And you already answered what a good life means, (laughs) which is fantastic. (laughs) This is so good. Um, I always love connecting with you. I do think it's interesting. Anything that helps us understand ourselves better allows us to communicate better with the people we love or within our work environments. I mean, we spend so much of our time there. I think it's so valuable Um, if people want to learn more about type, uh, they want to bring you in for their company, like, you know, and work with teams, where do I direct people to find you, Rob? Sure. Just have them email me, Rob at typecoach.com. I'm happy to direct them to the right person on my team, depending on what their curiosity is. Okay. And is there a way that they can learn more about their own type? Is there an easy way to do that? Yeah, I, what I'd be happy to do is provide uh, your listeners with access to our platform so they can check that out. And uh, you know, often that's the first step towards deciding they want to bring us into their organization. So more than happy to extend that invitation. Okay, so I'll have that over at, on the show notes page over at thegoodlifecoach.com. Share this one with a friend. I hope that you enjoyed it and, and saw yourself or saw the dynamics and it helped you realize maybe you know what you could do different. Just just have that better communication with those you love or those that you work with. Um, Rob, always so fun connecting with you. And um, I'm sure we'll do this again. Another five years, you're coming back. (laughs) Thanks so much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Rob.